What's going on everybody and welcome to my spoiler review of the entire season of Dexter New Blood. A little different setting. I usually sit over here at my computer and do a different, more relaxed, freeform setting when I have a lot to talk about and I do have a lot to talk about in regards to this season. Like I said, full spoilers, if you have not seen this season, especially if you have not seen the finale, please go and finish the show before coming back here. I'm going to get into every single detail, character, plot element of the show that I feel like needs to be discussed, and so this literally will ruin the show for you. Not that the show didn't already have to do a great job at ruining it for you on its own, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, guys, I need to get this out of the way now. Like I, I've been, I've been mixed, mixed positive all throughout this season. I've done a, a spoiler review of every single episode, all the way through these ten episodes. And there's been episodes that I've really enjoyed. There's been episodes that I felt like were meandering a lot. There's been episodes where I've liked things and been confused about things. But even before the finale aired, I was teetering on the edge and basically walked into the finale saying okay if they knock this finale out of the park that's going to tip the scales and I'll be able to forgive some of my issues with the rest of the season and overall I'll really like this one this will be at bare minimum mid-level Dexter and maybe even rise into the top tier depending on how great the ending is and then on the flip side of that if they absolutely botch this ending I'm going to teeter the other direction and all of my Small issues throughout the season will become large issues. All of my large issues throughout the season will become monumental issues. And unfortunately, it's going to be that type of conversation. There are things about this season that I do like, so it's not going to be a complete bitch fest. But after that finale, it really has unfortunately colored my response to this whole season in much more of a negative light than it's been episode by episode. So... Going through the things that I do really like about Dexter New Blood. First of all, all of the performances pretty much across the board were awesome. I mean, Michael C. Hall, for as much as I don't understand his approval of what they've done to the character twice now, him as an actor has been amazing. Like, he has brought to life one of the greatest characters in television history. He has consistently delivered one of the greatest performances in television history, even in the weaker seasons of Dexter, Michael C. Hall is never a problem. And he's never even like mediocre. He's always amazing. And he's just as good in this season of Dexter New Blood. It was just, it, it was so amazing to see him come back to this character, slip right back into that character like he never missed a beat. And, and he did phenomenal from start to finish. I also think that uh, Jack Elcott, the actor that played Harrison, did a really good job. Despite my thoughts on the character of Harrison that we'll get into, as a performance, he did really good. He, he did good at bouncing off of Dexter. He did good at playing both sides of the character, kind of that intriguing, somewhat lovable kid that's new in town, and you would, you would understand why he would kind of have this allure to certain people, why they'd want to hang out with him. At the same time, him having this darkness, this anger, this... Uh, long gestating pain from the abandonment of his father, from the death of his mother, all of that. I mean, it, is, it came across really well in the performance. So him as an actor, I think it's almost a shame that they did what they did story-wise because though they haven't announced it yet, or they decided not to do it, if they ever did decide to do a spinoff with Harrison, he could handle his own show as far as an actor. It's just a shame that they did what they did with his character because I don't think fans are ever going to want to want to show surrounding Harrison. Clancy Brown. I mean, if anybody aside from Michael C. Hall I walked in knowing was going to be awesome, it was Clancy Brown and he delivered. I mean, Clancy Brown is one of the greatest character actors of all time. I love this guy. He can play all different types of characters. And, and Kurt Caldwell was a character that was pretty well-rounded where you got to see a lot of the strengths of what Clancy Brown can do because he's kind of this lovable quirky guy he's this really strong willed guy that can gather a crowd and, and and captivate everybody and also be very creepy and so he kind of all three of those shades that i just listed of this character he plays in different aspects all throughout the season and, and does a damn good job so they always do a pretty damn good job at casting their main villain at bringing in some celebrity guest even the weaker seasons like season six i mean colin hanks did an awesome job with what they gave him so this is of no exception. Clancy Brown was great. So performance-wise, pretty much everybody, even the characters that I'm not listing, 
because I don't feel like they were given enough to do. What they were given to do, they did very well with. There was nobody in this show that did not come to play as far as their acting ability. I also think the show was shot very well. I think the show was, you know, there, there were certain creative things that they did that was very different. Like every single episode, the title of the episode was like this graphic effect that was put into the scene. Uh, and it was a really interesting effect every single episode to see how they were going to do that and, and how it washes away or how it does this little flickering effect to look like a neon light or whatever they did. That was a really cool element. There was even this little stylistic choice about once they show the title of Dexter New Blood, they did this little quick cut thing, almost like a dream sequence for about five seconds that kind of chopped together a bunch of scenes from the episode to kind of tease your eyes with some visuals that are coming. I thought it was kind of neat. It was a way that the, they kind of set you up with some expectations for the episode without really ever giving anything away plot wise. And uh, I do really like the setting of New York. I do really like the setting of New York. I think that uh, putting them in the cold, putting them in the small town, this podunk town where everything is so quiet and, and so much more small scale and kind of boring, but in a good way for the show, was such a nice little change from everything that Miami is, which is the opposite of everything I just said. Warm, vibrant, colorful, energetic, packed to the brim with, with characters and personalities. I thought it was a nice change to take him into a completely different element and to see Dexter operate in the opposite type of env environment that we're used to seeing him go into. And going along with this new setting comes a, a lot of new issues, a lot of new problems and obstacles that Dexter has to get over, which I really enjoyed. Like him having to work out of his element where you know he's been celibate, if you will, for 10 years. He hasn't killed anybody. And then as soon as he starts to feed that passenger again, he kind of has to figure out how to do his usual thing in this town where Miami was kind of like, he, he kind of was accustomed to what Miami had to deliver as far as where he gets certain things, where he can take people, how to diffuse situations. And all of that is new in this town. He has to go to this pet vet that knows him very well to get the tranquilizer that he needs, which in a sense leaves a trail. He has to cover up his tracks in the snow, which quite literally leaves tracks all the way that where he's going. Uh, even the new struggle about trying to become a father. I mean, this is something that kind of to the show's detriment in the last half became kind of an annoying thing to where it just seemed like they just didn't know what to do with Harrison, especially Astor and Cody too. They were just all but written off the show to where him as a father was never really held accountable by the show until now. I mean, he had Harrison and he always just had Jamie as his nanny, which might as well have been his fucking wife by the last couple of seasons to where anytime he had to leave the house, which seemed like every single day at any given moment, he would just drop his kid with her. And so the show never really stopped to focus and say, no, you have to be a father. You have to be there. There's something going on. And Dexter's new, Dexter New Blood brought that element in to where Harrison shows up. He's obviously a teenager. He's fully cognizant of what's going on. He has demands. He has a, an opinion. He has a voice. And so him having to balance his life, his killer urges with being a father was a big struggle this season. And, and though there's elements of the character of Harrison and what adds to that struggle that I did not like that I'll get into, just the overall thing about him having to be held accountable as a father and him constantly having to choose whether or not I have to deal with this thing with my son or continue on what I normally would do if I was my single life dad that I've been for most of this series, I thought that was a nice little change of pace and it brought this new element, this new obstacle to Dexter that we had never really seen before. Now, the new cast of characters pretty much all fall into the mixed category for me. They're, they're all of the new things that came along with the setting and these new struggles were mixed. The idea of a new setting, the visuals of a new setting, the obstacles and the restrictions of the new setting, I really liked. But the new cast of characters, I felt like were a big missed opportunity. There's things that I liked about them and then there's things where it's like, you didn't quite nail it there. And I'm gonna get a little bit more into this, but it really did affect the, the energy of the show that they did not replace the characters that we know and love from Miami with something that's equally as fun and as captivating. All of these characters kind of fall into that boring small town category as far as how their characters are portrayed. 
So you have Kurt Caldwell. He's the big villain of the season. And I think Clancy Brown as an actor, his performance, and even to a certain degree, the way that they stylize the character as far as how he looks and how they slowly reveal how he does things, I thought was great. And I think that there's elements to his character that makes him one of the better Dexter villains as far as him being genuinely likable while being creepy. There's not too many of the villains that you could say were really likable. They were just kind of fucked up from the beginning. And I think that the way that he looks with his ski mask and the hunting gear and everything, that's a really cool, creepy image. Uh, I think that the reveal, ultimately, of his little museum of death was one of the more creepy visuals that we've ever gotten in this show, where they're walking through and the lights are coming on, and you see all these women just, like, preserved, like, wax statues, was really cool. And the, the elements, like, towards the middle of the season, especially whenever he kidnapped that one girl that kind of messed up his modus operandi, and he had to shoot her while she wasn't running away, and then he gets pissed off and starts punching her skull. Like, all those elements where he gets really pushed to the psycho side, I was captivated. I was like, dude, this is a really good villain. I, I really am, am, am invested and want to see more of this guy and figure out what's ticking behind that, that head of his, what's keeping him going, what's, what's motivating him to do all of this. So they did a great job with that. The problem that I had with the character is that especially paired with what they force us to accept about Angela and her ability to put things together, I thought that it was really far-fetched by the end that he was able to do all of this for so long in this tiny-ass town where everybody knows everybody and knows everything about everybody, and nobody ever even suspected him, let alone caught him, especially Angela, who has been dedicating every fiber of her being to trying to solve this missing woman's uh, continuing missing woman spree in this town for a decade plus. So they, they didn't do a good enough job at, at making me believe that he could get away with that. Just by having this cabin out in the middle of nowhere that they, somebody should have known about and a hatch that's like not even locked or like or secured in a way where nobody could could find it or open it. They literally just had to see this pipe and like, oh, what's in here? Oh, a museum of death. So I feel like they kind of fell on their face a bit with the logic of that. I also, by the end of it, was not completely satisfied with the answers that we were given regarding why this character is a killer and why he continues to do what he does. And as much as I like the visual of his killer, as much as I love the performance, and I'm curious how much my reception of this character is being colored by the fact that I just love Clancy Brown. If it was somebody else, maybe I'd be a little bit harsher on them. But by the end of it, it felt like Kirk Caldwell was kind of like a greatest hits of killers that we've already had in this show. And what I mean by that is that you have this whole element that he is draining the blood from these bodies and the visuals of that in the first couple episodes, which is very reminiscent of the ice truck killer from season one. Then you have this whole element that he is taking in runaway girls that nobody's going to know, nobody's going to look for, nobody's going to miss and then killing them and preserving them in this device or in, in this container, which in a lot of ways gave me the same vibes and harkened back to Jordan Chase and the Barrel Girl murders from season five. Then you have the ultimate reveal of what his actual motivation is, why he's trying to do this, and he's trying to kill these people and preserve their innocence as they are there which is right out of the book of Trinity. It's exactly what he did to the kids. And so by the end of it, it just I started to look at it and I'm like, they really didn't do a whole lot new with this character. They just kind of retreaded familiar territory and kind of took pieces of a bunch of different people and, and made a new character out of things that we've already seen. And I haven't seen anybody bring that up yet, so I don't know if I'm just in the minority that saw it that way, or maybe me putting this out, people are gonna be like, holy shit, you're right, I, I really don't know. It wasn't something that really was a detriment to his character, but by the end of it, I just I felt a little disappointed. I'm like, man, I wanted like a really, a really unique motivation for this guy. I wanted something that was like really gonna be fucked up, and just him seeing his father beat up a bunch of hookers, and that's why he decided to kill women. I was like, I don't know. That's a little bit of a flimsy explanation for me. So, Kurt Caldwell unfortunately falls into the mixed, mixed positive, but mixed. Then you have Angela. 
Now, Angela was one of the more frustrating characters with the way that they wrote her, because I think in the first few episodes, maybe even the first half of the season, I really liked her character. I loved the little, uh, the, the little uh, switch that they pulled in the opening episode where she's pulling over Jim Lindsay and then it's his girlfriend and she just starts fucking him in the back seat. And I really enjoyed how their relationship was portrayed early on in the season. Basically all the way up into the point where she finds out that he's Dexter Morgan and he's somebody that she doesn't know and there's all these secrets. And I loved when she confronted him. Like, like even the fact that she knew and the way that she confronted him pulling him over the same way she did in the early episode, that was great. All of the reservations and the questions and the hesitancy, I liked all of that. I even liked the fact that he kind of pulls his typical Dexter thing where he's trying to explain things away and assumes that she's just gonna fall into the same little spell that every other person in the show always fell into where he could just talk his way out of anything and she's like, whoa, motherfucker, no, no. I liked that. Unfortunately, from that point onward, it just felt like her character was on one path, was one note, and the, the nuances of her feelings for Dexter was just gone. And she was no longer the girlfriend Angela, she was just the sheriff. And any kind of ties or emotions or confliction that she might have had towards Jim or Dexter was just gone and they never explored that again. And from that moment forward, she was just suspicious of the guy. And that was really hard for me to kind of be entertained by. And, and part of that's because we love the character of Dexter. I mean, that's just the problem when you have a character like this. And, and, and I'll get more into this in the finale. And that's what I feel like the writers and the showrunners don't understand sometimes, unfortunately, is that even if you're writing a bad guy, I don't give a fuck if it's Dexter, if it's Walter White, if it's Tony Soprano, does not matter if this is a fucking murderer, a drug dealer, it doesn't matter if this is the lead character of a show that we love, we love this character. And we don't enjoy, or we don't really even identify with or sympathize with anybody that is trying to take this character down, even if their motivations are correct. That's a reason why as amazing of a show as Breaking Bad is and as amazing as the way that they write all those characters, years later you still have people that say that Skylar is one of the most hated characters in TV history, even though she was fucking right the entire time. Everything that she did in suspicion of her husband and even moves towards her husband was correct, but we didn't like her because she was fucking with Walt. So it's the same thing here. So when you go from that reveal of this guy is actually Dexter Morgan from Miami to the end of the show, and it's nothing but now this character is doing things that's going to hurt our favorite character, it's hard to, to like that person. And there was room there for them to, to develop different aspects of her character and show her confliction and show like this hesitancy or some kind of a anything on the girlfriend side of her and they just washed that away and now she's just the sheriff and it's all about business, it's all about the law and fuck this guy. Any amount of time I had with him and I loved him, that's just gone from here on out. We're not talking about it ever again. And so that paired with the fact that, and I'm gonna get more into this as a whole, the really convenient writing of how much information she was just given, how easily she was able to access other pieces of information it just made her character kind of lifeless in the last half of the season. And uh, by the end of it, despite the fact that I think the actors did a really good job, I just did not like her character. I just did not enjoy the journey that they took on with her. And there was a, a much better way to portray that character, even if she was gonna do everything and ultimately be the one to take Dexter down, there was a way to make us like that character and kind of be conflicted about that journey towards the end where we're like, damn, like I love Dexter, but she's right and I like her too and I'm not gonna root against her completely. And I just feel like they failed to do that, at least for me. Then you have Audrey, not gonna talk about her very much. The daughter of Angela, she was just there. Uh, I mean, there wasn't really anything stand out about her character. They start off with her being like this, you know, climate activist against this guy that was in the show for like <laughs> two episodes and then just fucking disappeared. Uh, and eventually she fucks Harrison. And there wasn't really anything plot element wise, there wasn't really anything character development wise regarding her character. She was just the daughter of Dexter's girlfriend that eventually started fucking his son. And so the, another character that is just like, there's nothing really interesting about her, sorry. 
Then you have Podcaster Molly. Now there was an interesting potential when this character came into the show to where she's got this popular podcast, Mary Fucking Kill, which is a great title, by the way. I'm jealous I didn't think of that. And uh, she has done all this research of all these different killers. She's got a whole thing dedicated to Trinity. She's got a whole thing dedicated to BHB. And she comes into this town that all of these missing women have just been, it's like a black hole. People are just disappearing left and right. There's something going on here. I want to check it out. And you have this missing son of this rich, rich guy in town, Clancy Brown, and she joins right as the manhunt is starting. And there was an interesting potential there, especially with her knowledge of the Bay Harbor Butcher case and the Trinity case, that she was going to be the one to blow the lid off of Dexter's cover. And they never went there, strangely. They never went there. They want you to believe that this character has done so much research and put so much information and is even to a point where she is actively saying that the Bay Harbor Butcher was not Dokes or is likely not Dokes or there's at least a 50-50 chance that it was not Dokes in her podcast. And having a whole episode on Trinity to the point where she's got pictures of Rita. But she doesn't immediately recognize Dexter? I never understood that. I never bought that. I thought that was going to be the, the obvious way that they were going to do that is that she was going to be face to face with him and then be like, hey, what's up? And then go talk to Angela and be like, that's Dexter Morgan. That's the guy who, who Trinity killed his wife. And that was going to be how she figured it out. And they wrote that into the show as such a, a believable way for that to happen. But no, they chose the plot convenience and contrivance way of she just magically happened to see Batista, of all people, at this one moment in this little convention, and he happened to sit down and talk to her, of all people, and randomly bring up Dexter Morgan for no fucking reason, and randomly bring up the fact that he had a son named Harrison for no reason. That's how she figures it out. What the fuck, writers? Like, <laughs> kind of the same problem I had with the finale. I'm like, you set up an obvious, very compelling way to do this, and then you just went this way just cause? What the fuck? So, uh, yeah, I don't know. Her, her character was interesting. There was interesting potential there, but by the end of it, it felt like they just didn't go there when there was a lot of interesting ways to make her character very integral to the season when she just ends up being one of Kurt Caldwell's victims for reasons that's unexplained because she's not even a runaway. Nonetheless, uh, so the entire cast of characters, I, I mean, even Coach Logan, even Coach Logan, this guy doesn't really have much of a plot development or much of a character development in the show. He's just the nicest guy. He's just the shining white knight of the town. Great cop, great coach, it, it cares about his kids, does everything by the book. And all throughout the season, I was wondering, I'm like, are they going to do anything with this guy? They're just making him out to be the most innocent person in the world. And then you get to the last 15 minutes of the show and you find out why that's the only reason that they gave him that development. But even him, good character, but ultimately just as a whole, the new characters were mixed for me because of the way that they executed their actual stories, but also because nobody in this Dexter New Blood town, in this, this new revival, can even touch the level of energy and the level of likability and the level of fun for the characters that we got in the original eight seasons, even on their worst seasons. So that whole thing was just by the end, uh, no, no, not as good, sorry. Now, uh, something else that I was, I was mixed on by the end of it, it's kind of pouring into the negative category for me, and that is the change of tone, the change of pace, and the change of energy that this season had. Now, I'm somebody that when they announced that Dexter was coming back, even before they showed that he was in New York, I was like, okay, he's got to be somewhere different. Like, don't take him back to Miami. Don't take him back to Miami Metro. As much as I love those characters, don't just go back and do another season of Dexter. It needs to be different. It needs to look different. It needs to feel different. It needs to flow differently. And by the end of the show, while I still agree that was the right approach, and while I still think that... You know, maybe there was a way to do it better, but that was definitely the right decision to make. The change of energy, especially in this show, really hurt the show for me. Like, all throughout the season, I just kept feeling like the pacing was off, the, the energy was off, just everything about the way that they portray this show and this character in this new revival season was so different to what we've seen for the, pe the previous eight seasons that it just didn't have the same level of, of energy for me. 
to where it just didn't feel like Dexter. Like I'm watching Dexter clearly, there's elements here, but even the way the show is shot to where it's letterboxed at the top and the bottom instead of full frame to where when they do the flashback thing in episode nine and they're showing how he killed the Joaquin Phoenix copycat, they go back to the regular framing and the, the way that they shoot the scenes and pace the scenes out and a lot of monologues and the music and it's like, this feels like Dexter. That's why because the way they shoot it, the way that they edit it, and the way that they frame everything in Dexter New Blood is so different. The way that the color of Miami is just totally gone and everything's just white and gray in this town. The way that the music is, is, is gone for the most part. There's, there's cues of it once in a while, but the music is gone. The level of inner monologue that we get, the quirkiness of the humor, the, the pacing of the episodes, the breakneck pacing, the fun, dark comedy aspect to it. A lot of that was gone for most of the season. And while I understand the approach, and I agreed with the approach, and I was actually saying that before they announced it, that they should take that approach of making it different and feel different, it just, I didn't enjoy it as much. It just felt like some integral pieces of the Dexter experience were missing. And so it was a change for the sake of change that I think the motivation behind that change was correct. But by the end of it, I, I, I missed, I missed the, the feel of the original show. And so I was kind of on the fence about that most of the season. I'm like, God, like I, I don't want them to necessarily just go back to the drawing board and do the same thing. But I'm not liking anything that they're replacing the old energy, the old pacing, the old look with more than I like the old show. So by the end of it, I, I, I missed all of those elements. Now going full on into negatives. The writing this season was just all over the place. There was things that was really good about it, certain ways that they were setting up things, certain ways that they wrote, like Kurt Caldwell, and ways that they wrote how Dexter is getting back into all of this, and writing some of, towards the end, some of the way that him and Harrison's relationship is coming up. And especially in the back half of the season, but even some small moments in the first half, it just felt like such cheap, convenient, lazy writing. To the point where as a Dexter fan, I was having trouble buying into the things that they were trying to get me to accept. And that was one of the biggest things where I was teetered on the edge. I'm like, okay, if the finale is awesome, I'll forgive some of this stuff and kind of look past it. If the finale sucks, all of this stuff is going to look so much worse for me in hindsight. And that's actually 100% what happened. So, uh, everything regarding how Angela is put on the path and continued on the path to figuring out that Dexter is the Bay Harbor Butcher, almost none of that worked for me. There's a certain element to him letting his guard down and being sloppier and finally one person just gets enough information to surprise him with the fact that they figured it out that I enjoy and that I, I'm behind, but you had to buy so much convenience for her to get to that point that it kind of ruined it. To where she's only put on this path in the first place because Harrison gets fucked up at a party, decides for whatever reason to look at Audrey in the face and say, my dad's name's not even Jim, and then walks away. And it's like, dude, that, what? Why are you saying that, first of all? I don't believe the fact that that's what she would say in that moment, but that's what we do to, to get everybody on it. Like I said, you, you wrote in a perfectly plausible and captivating reason with the podcaster, Molly, and you chose to go this route. Okay, whatever. Within the same episode, she Angela goes to this fucking convention and Batista just happens to be there. And Batista just happens to sit down with her of all the people in this convention. And he just happens to bring up the Bay Harbor Butcher and just happens to bring up Dexter. And then in the most contrived way possible, he's like, yeah, they had a really cute kid too. Man, what was his name? Which I don't buy for a fucking second that he would not remember who Harrison is or remember any details of, of, of Dexter in his life. He was so close to Dexter and Deb. I don't fucking buy that whatsoever. That was, I didn't buy that writing, but whatever. We go on that and say, hmm, what was his name? And then he walks away, gets to the bar and stops around, turns around, oh yeah, Harrison. Dude, she doesn't give a fuck. 
<laughs> she's third generation don't give a fuck to this piece of information. She, you're telling her about a kid of a missing guy that you don't even hardly remember for reasons I don't understand and you think it's relevant enough to stop and yet again clarify for her what this fucking kid's name is. Weird, contrived, forced. So all that information put together is what sets her on this path. And it just felt like shoving a square peg into a round hole. They, just, they had to get there, they didn't quite figure out how, even though they had a character written into the show to perfectly get there, and so they just forced her onto this path. And then from then on, while I understand her initial reservation to Jim now that she realizes that he's this other person and he's got this other life and like, who the fuck are you? Do I even know you? I get all of that. But from that point forward, some of the things that push her onto this path, I didn't quite buy into either. Like she finds out that he beat the shit out of the guy that gave the drugs to his son. Perfectly plausible thing to happen to any father. And she's like, really? That's weird. I need to go investigate this. And it's like, why? <laughs> What about that story is getting your spidey sense tingling? Jim's son almost died of a fucking heroin overdose or whatever the hell it was. And he went and beat the fuck out of the person that made the drugs or sold him the drugs. I would hear that story and I would never suspect anybody. I'd be like, oh yeah, I'd do the same thing. <laughs> so that was just weird to me that that was another thing. She's just like, that's weird. I need to find out more. She goes, finds out about the needle mark, goes through all of this and, uh, I, I've ranted on Angela quite a bit in the finale, but just uh, from there on out, like the, there's there's an element to this story about you find out that this guy that you think you've known for months, maybe even years before they started dating, is this other person missing from Miami when this other serial killer, and it, like there's, there's things about that that I can understand raising some questions, but the way that they shoved her into the path to make those inferences and to get those questions, I didn't buy. And then she's just Googling things and figuring things out on Google, podcast Molly, she's listening to the Bay Harbor Butcher episode for reasons. It just all of that felt like plot contrivance to me all the way through. You have uh, even the thing about, uh, which is the one moment where I thought they were going to start to make her character interesting again, to where she figures out that Kurt Caldwell probably was trying to keep them away from this little search zone. So she goes out and searches these caves and just happens to find, of all the victims that could possibly be in this cave, her friend Iris. I even thought that was pretty contrived. One that Kurt would leave that body there when he clearly has done a really good job at hiding all the evidence and he has kept all of these people, uh, all of these women in this little museum, but the one victim of all, he just leaves right at the entrance of this cave. The fact that the body was left there in the first place, I didn't buy, and the fact that of all the victims, it's the one that she's going to have the most emotional tie to is the one that she immediately runs into. I didn't even quite like that plot element. So that, to me, also kind of felt like plot cheating. You had um, Kurt Caldwell figuring out what Dexter did. I still don't quite understand how he came up with that. I like the fact that he knew, and throughout most of the season, he was doing things against Dexter, and Dexter and us as audience members didn't realize that he was and didn't realize that he knew. That was cool. And when he finally revealed to him that... Motherfucker, I know what's been going on. I've been on your ass for weeks now. Like, I like that. Like, that was something where I'm like, dude, like, this is the first guy that has been smart enough not to let Dexter know that he knows. And I like that. But I still don't quite understand how he got there. So the explanation that, that he gives is that the night that he drunkenly picked him up from that diner and took him home, that there was snowfall. And when he got home, he realized it wasn't snow, that it was ash. Which then they make you'd think that he did this big leap and said, okay, if this is ash on my jacket, I need to go see what was in that incinerator. I assume people put things in that incinerator pretty fucking regularly. That's why they have the incinerator there. So I don't understand why this particular time having ash fall, he's like, why are people burning things in this fucking incinerator that's publicly accessible? So he goes back there, presumably finds the pins and the screws from his son traces the, the, the number, realizes that it's his son's. Okay, somebody killed my son, put him in this incinerator, and then immediately jumps to the conclusion that it was Jim Lindsay. Just because he was driving around in town the night that the, the, the ash was falling. How many other people were fucking walking around in that town that night? 
So even that, they didn't quite make me believe in the inferences that he jumped to and the fact that he was 100% right. So even that, I was just like, I need more, guys. Uh, I need a little bit more from that. that. That doesn't quite work for me. And then you have Dexter actually keeping that titanium screw. <laughs> the one piece of evidence that links him definitively, somewhat definitively, to the murder of Matt, and he just keeps it in his fucking cabin. So that when his house is burned down, Angela, that's the one thing that she finds is sitting there, like uh, amongst all that rubble, the one spot that she steps in, she's like, oh, it's the exact same pin that somebody just stuck in my mailbox. Again, logic leaps. I, I, don't, I don't buy Dexter doing that. I understand that there's things throughout this season that are portraying him as being a little rusty, a little out of his element, which was a big stretch for me because when he says that I've been killing people in the hundreds, uh, it's like riding a bike, bitch. I don't think 10 years off would make you suddenly a fucking moron. You know, leaving the blood trail all the way from the kill site in episode one all the way to his cabin. He has to go and run over the blood trail for miles in episode two. That was a big stretch for me, but that was another one where I'm like, dude, no. No, you're just trying to force things to work. You have an end game in mind, and you're trying to force us there instead of organically get there in a believable way, in a way that's earned, which is fully encompassed in the last 10 to 15 minutes of the show, which I'll save a little bit more thoughts of when I actually talk about the finale. But the entire last 10, 15 minutes of the finale is all messy writing for me. From the moment that he snaps Logan's neck all the way to the final frame of the show was just sloppy as hell. The fact that Kurt Caldwell was never suspected or caught by Audrey is another thing that was just a big writing convenience to me. I mean, you can't get us as audience members to buy into the fact that this woman, of all of the people that Dexter has encountered in nine seasons, which include other serial killers, which includes the FBI, which includes the includes the lead serial killer hunter of the FBI, which includes Dokes and LaGuerta and everybody in the Miami Metro Police Force that he was with every single day for years. And his sister, who he not only worked with, but lived with and she knew him better than anybody. And his wife, all these people never suspected a thing or never got anywhere close to solving the fact that he was the Bay Harbor Butcher with the exception of Dokes and LaGuerta, even though her, her evidence was pretty rocky. But you want us to believe that this woman of all people is the one that gets there. But she doesn't figure out in over a decade, almost 20 years of being on the ass of this case of these missing women that Kurt Caldwell is somehow the person that did it. You literally, I mean, from the beginning of the show, they set up two people, one of which was just stupid. The fact that they had a red herring, like we didn't know Clancy Brown was the fucking villain. Every time you have a guest celebrity star, they're the fucking killer in this seasons. Why are you trying to make us believe it's somebody else? That was dumb. From the beginning, I thought that was dumb. And the fact that the guy just disappeared from the show after that showed that they didn't know what the fuck they were doing with that character. So you have two people in town that presumably are the only people powerful enough to get away with this. Both money, you know, social stature. They're the only people. And the fact that all, or a good chunk of these missing women all stop through Kurt's diner and go through the same thing. Hey, can I get an application for this woman? and then she doesn't take the job. You're gonna tell me that fucking supervisor behind the, the counter is not eventually gonna be like, you know what, Kurt? Every single one of these missing women that we have in this town, they stopped here and you almost gave them a job. That's a little fucking crazy, isn't it? <laughs> Anything that could have led her to the inferences that she gets to regarding Kurt, it just, it, it, I don't buy the fact that she never got there. If you're trying to tell us that this is the character that solved the Bay Harbor Butcher case, but can't solve this fucking missing woman's case, those two don't go together. Those two don't go together. I'm sorry. The M99 fuck up is another big writing issue for me. And it's to the point where I'm like, how do you have the people that wrote this show and people that starred in this show and nobody raised a red flag about that? When the fans of the show raise the red flag immediately. There's even a line of dialogue in the episode where he goes to get the ketamine to take out the drug manufacturer, where he says something along the lines of, this isn't my usual go-to, but I guess we'll have to use it. 
So they know that this is not his, his typical thing, that he uses M99, and he used M99 for eight seasons. But he uses ketamine once. And they want us to buy into the fact that Angela thinks that that ties him to the Bay Harbor Butcher, and that Dexter is scared enough that that might tie him to the Bay Harbor Butcher, that he goes through what he goes through in the last 10 to 15 minutes of this show. The case was rocky as it is, but as soon as she says, I gotta talk to you about one thing, ketamine. He should have been like, okay, fuck, let's talk about it. I used it once, bitch, what you got? Well, what you got? So uh, that was a big thing where I'm like, how are you fucking this up? How are you fucking this up? How are Dexter fans telling you he used M99 and you guys don't, uh, didn't know that? And you're writing that into the show as a gotcha moment? No, 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 sorry. Before I start talking about the finale, the other negative that I had, actually two things I need to talk about. Uh, three things, damn, I'm getting ahead of myself. So continuing on with the negatives, I'm sorry. Freeform tends to have these little fuck ups. The show towards the end started to really give me anxiety as a fan and, and make me really confused about where we were heading because they were starting to play coy with whether or not this was actually a finale of the series or if this was just the end of season one and we were going to go forward. Now, I understand somewhat that they have to play coy with it because otherwise they'll let you in on the fact that Dexter is either going to get caught or die and they want you to not really expect what's going to happen. But the reason that it was confusing for me is, which now we know this was the final season of Dexter, at least ones that have Dexter as the character, Nothing about this season had a sense of finality to me. Nothing about this season, aside from the final episode, felt like a series ending season. And they had the same problem in season eight. There wasn't really a whole lot in that season that felt final because of how messy that they were doing everything. But this season was pretty focused and it still never felt like we're heading towards the end game. It felt much more like the new beginning and the title New Blood just kind of reinforced that. Like, by the end, before you get to episode 10, I would have bet money there was going to be more. Because they were just, nothing about this felt like we're heading towards the last we're ever going to see this character. It only felt like we were setting up new. Whether that was one more season, two more seasons, or as many seasons until the ratings dropped like they did the first time, I didn't know. But I, I walked into the finale going, I don't know if this is it or not. It just doesn't feel like it. So by the end, that was something that was very weird for me, that the show's pacing and approach just never really felt final. To the point where it felt like the first half of the season really kind of took its time and meandered and kind of danced around plot lines. And I felt like it just wasn't really kicking into gear and it wasn't really getting started. And it was kind of starting to frustrate me. You go back and watch those reviews where I'm like, eh, you know, we're four episodes in, we're five. It doesn't really feel like it's really getting going. And everybody's like, be patient. You don't understand slow storytelling. You don't understand plot development. And I'm like, fucking Christ, dude. It just doesn't feel like we're going anywhere. It just kind of feels like they have you know, maybe six episodes worth of story and they're trying to stretch it out over 10 or something. I was getting worried. And then the last half of the show felt like they were just rushing everything. We got to get Angela to come up with all this stuff. We got to get Dexter to be here. We got to get Harrison to be here. We got to get Kurt to be here. And that was very awkwardly paced to where the, it, how you couldn't have paced that better amongst 10 episodes, I don't quite understand, especially if this was in fact the final season. The first half of this season definitely didn't feel like that. And the last half, it was just like, what are we doing? Whoa, 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 whoa. Slow down, slow down. What are we doing? So that was a little odd. Deb as the voice. Deb as the new Harry, as the, the other side of his personality. I liked the idea of it. I really liked it in the first episode. I got tired of it quick because it was written so one note. In the first episode, she would yell at him. She'd be like comforting him in bed and like, it's okay, it's okay, we can do this. Like there were so many different shades to who Deb was as a character that was being portrayed by this voice in his head. After the first episode, after he does his first kill in 10 years, it's just nine episodes of Deb berating him and screaming at him. And that was one of the more tiresome elements of the character of Deb as it was whenever she was actually alive. And so the fact that they decided to just do that and stick with that for the rest of the season, that wore thin on me quick. 
to where like by like episode three or episode four, I was just like, is this all we're doing with Deb? Just every single time he decides to do something, she's just gonna pop up and tell him he's a fucking idiot. And then that's it. And, and just, just talk shit to him and talk down to him every single time. I understand that that's the side of his head that's like beating himself up over the grief of what's happened. But as an audience member, that's not entertaining to just get the visual of her berating him for nine episodes. So by the end of it, I did not like that at all. Did not like the way that they did that. Then you have the character of Harrison, and this is the last negative that I have before I start to talk about the finale a bit. Now, Harrison, much like Deb, is something that I liked at first and then quickly wore thin on what they were doing with the character. I thought that him showing up was a nice little way to kind of throw this giant monkey wrench into the system of how his life has been right at the most inopportune time to where he's just killed somebody for the first time in 10 years. I liked the struggles that they had at first with Harrison showing up, missing a decade of time and of knowledge with his father, trying to rekindle any of that, them trying to kind of learn about each other, his anger at his father, his anger at the world, all of that made logical sense and it was fine at first. But then you get to a point to where there's like a five to six episode stretch to where the interaction of their characters as well as the development of their relationship is like literally stuck in quicksand. And every single scene you get with Dexter and Harrison in some way, shape or form is essentially them connecting for a millisecond, quickly getting into an argument, Harrison stomping away like a pissed off, angry, angsty teenager and Dexter going, oh, I need to fix this, but I have other things to do. And it just repeated that cycle for like half this season. So where Harrison's doing this fucked up shit. He gets into this knife fight with a kid at school, sets up the fact that he's going to be a, a school shooter. And when his dad starts to ask any questions about it, he just gets defensive. What do you think, I'm a psycho? And then just gets mad and then just walks away. And Dexter at this point knows that his kid is fucked up. He knows that he set up the crime scene. He knows that he's carrying around a straight razor. He knows that in all likeliness, He's either already killed somebody or is pretty fucking close to that point. And maybe this kid at school would have been the one if, if something didn't stop it sooner. And he just doesn't feel the urgency to talk about it. I didn't buy into that. And it, and it got to the point where I'm like, okay, whatever. Next episode, something's going to happen. They're going to talk. And the frustrating part about it was that the disconnect that these two characters had was literally like one sentence had to be said by Dexter to mend all of this. And the frustration as a viewer of episode after episode after episode after episode of that one fucking sentence just refusing to come out of his mouth for reasons that I don't completely understand really wore thin. Like I understand that Dexter in his motivation as a father didn't necessarily want his son to have to go down the same path as him. But whenever he discovered that his son had a dark passenger and carried around the straight razor that Trinity, at that point, anybody with common sense can pretty much tell you he's already on that path, buddy. <laughs> he's already on that path. And so you can either be what Harry was to you or you can continue to deny it. And I just don't fully buy that Dexter would deny it for the amount of time that they expected us to believe that he was. And so, so many times of them almost connecting and then Harrison, fuck you, dad, walks away. I'm taking a job with Kurt, fuck you. I'm going to this place, fuck you. I'm joining the wrestling team, fuck you. I broke this kid's arm, fuck you, leave me alone. And Dexter just going, God damn it, Here, I got other things I gotta do. Hello? It was just, it, it, it was one note. To the point where when they finally do connect as characters in those, the last episode and a half before the finale, where Kurt almost kills Harrison Dexter shows up to save him, and then finally Dexter slowly reveals that he also has a dark passenger, also has a darkness, he has a code, and then eventually revealing that, yes, I fucking kill people, I've killed in the hundreds, and Harrison's like, oh my god, you've saved hundreds of people, like, as soon as we got to that point, I'm like, finally, fuck, and that stuff was good, where I'm like, hey, he's bringing like this new shade of understanding to what Dexter does for better or worse where he's like you've saved like thousands of people and Dexter's like I really thought of it that way you're right and, and all of that I thought was really good just for them to get to the finale and take this character that at least for me they have
failed miserably to get me to like and to buy into and to be invested in just started to go onto the path of making me like this character just for him to pull a fucking pivot right there in the final five minutes of the show and decide that his darkness, his crimes, his flaws as a person are irrelevant. We don't need to talk about those or acknowledge those, but dad, you killed Coach Logan and now you gotta die. And now we'll start to talk about the finale. And I'm not going to rant on this for another 30 minutes. I have a video where I talk specifically about the finale, which is succeeding like a motherfucker. And I thank you all who have watched that video who are watching this, because that's, that's going to be a very big video for my channel, which is a surprise. Because Dexter content has not necessarily been huge numbers for me. And, and I you know, haven't really cared, because I love watching the show, so I'll do it even if only 500 people are watching. But the fact that uh, so many people apparently feel the exact same way that I did about the finale and are really enjoying my video for that, that that's awesome. And, and, in a bittersweet way. You know, I, I still wish that I was in the minority. I still wish that I was among the loud minority that really was displeased with what they did. And I wish that so many other people really enjoyed the show. It sucks that it seems at least like the majority of people are as disappointed and pissed off and, and just crushed as I am. But the finale that they gave, unfortunately, that, that that's the nature of what happens. And I just, it blows me away that yet again, it seems like the showrunner and the writer just don't understand the character and don't understand how the audience views the character. It felt like they had this idea in their head, which Clyde Phillips has admitted since years ago, while the show was going on without him, that his ending was Dexter dying. It seems like they were so fixated on the end result that they could not wrap their heads around how to make the journey to get there plausible and earned and they were just so desperate to kill the character off for whatever reason that it was more so about we just got to get this done and not as much about how we get it done and that's the problem that most of us are having like i have yet to really hear a great or even completely understandable defense for this finale i know there's people that like it and i do like i do appreciate the fact that you guys like it i'm not saying that you're wrong or you're less of a fan than me or any of that bullshit if you got to the end of this and that was satisfying for you, I'm jealous. I'm literally jealous of that experience. But I have yet to have anybody that likes the finale really explain to me in a way that makes me understand it. The only person that I've had a meaningful conversation with about this finale that liked it and loved it, their explanation was more along the lines of, the fact that it was kind of uh, left without resolution, was left without closure, and was so bittersweet and tragic that they appreciated that side of it because of the nature of death. That's kind of what goes along with it, which is a really interesting way to look at the finale. But in the same time, that also kind of acknowledges the fact that this finale had no closure, no resolution, and left a lot of things just like a gaping wound for viewers. And so... Even that person telling me that that's why they liked it is in, in a way saying, yeah, you're right, all these things are big gaping wounds for viewers. So I just haven't had anybody really explain to me in a profound way why this is a good ending, the perfect ending, or a satisfying ending for this character, for this show. So I want to have that conversation with somebody. I really do. For me, this finale... The first 45 minutes or so when they're setting up all of these really compelling ways to wrap this up, I was on the edge of my seat. I was loving it. I was like, hey, they're doing it. Holy shit. And then the last 15 minutes of it absolutely destroyed it. Destroyed the episode, destroyed the season, and yet again left the giant stain on the legacy of the show for me and for a lot of people, it seems. I don't buy the fact at all that Dexter would kill Logan, that he would freak out, that he would get that worried about his potential incarceration, that he would leave the station with all of the evidence there, not do anything to manipulate the scene, run through town covered in blood, run through the woods to his son, not even bother for a second to divert the story or try to divert his attention or lie or disguise the fact that he just killed the coach, just outright tells his son, 
and then lets his son kill him and encourages his son to kill him. I just don't buy any of that. It just, it doesn't make any sense to me. Dexter dying as the ultimate punishment for what he has done. That is not the problem. Inevitably, it was going to go one of two ways if this was the, in fact, end of the character. Either he was going to get caught or he was going to get killed. And there were numerous ways to go either of those two routes in a captivating and satisfying way. I still hold true to the fact that I think him being caught and having to face his crimes and face the people that he has affected was a much more satisfying, captivating, and much more narratively satisfying conclusion to the show and to the character than killing him. But there was still ways to kill his character that would have been captivating, that would have been satisfying, that would have felt earned. But the way that they decided to do it was not one of them. And the ultimate disappointment with the season, the series finale is that they set up some of those plausible ways within the same fucking episode. It's not like they were never heading in that direction. It's not like they, we have to do it this way. This is the only way. It has to be Harrison. It has to be in the woods. It has to be because he did this thing that's against the code. And now his son is confused about all that. It has to be that way. That was only the only path that we ever looked at. Well, then why were you setting up these other things just half an hour ago? Why were you telling us as audience members that Batista, after eight seasons, and now 10 years between those uh, eight season and the ninth season, was finally going to get the Bay Harbor Butcher, was finally going to get the answers, was finally going to get the closure and the resolution to all of these blood-soaked, gaping wounds that he has had from the previous eight seasons of this show, all the death that has surrounded Miami Metro. He was finally going to get that. And we as audience members were finally going to see anybody, but especially B Batista, which was the right character to do it, anybody from Miami Metro that was somebody that believed and always trusted Dexter, we were going to see them finally see the monster that Dexter was and have seasons of realization wash over their face in a scene of confrontation. Why put that in the heads of viewers and not deliver it? To me, that's a gigantic fuck you to the audience. If you just didn't have that scene with Batista in the finale, I can't really say for sure. The finale might have gone over a little bit better for a lot of people. But dangling that fucking carrot in front of us that we have been dying to see for years just to say, nope, you don't get that, fuck you. That is a gigantic knife to the heart of Dexter fans. Most of us. And I just don't for the life of me understand the writing motivations, the story motivations for doing that. I, I just don't understand it. Even if your, your sole motivation by the end of this episode was to subvert expectations and give people an ending that they weren't expecting even within this episode, sometimes subverting expectations is a bad thing. I had one person comment on my video saying that you just don't like it because it wasn't what you wanted. Which I've always had a problem with people saying that because to a certain extent, that's how we all view art. I don't care if it's a video game, a CD, a TV show, a movie. If it's not to a certain extent what you wanted, of course you're going to be disappointed. That's just how fucking, that, that's how human nature works. But taking that in the most negative connotation possible, no. I'm not upset because the ending that I myself, not a Hollywood writer, came up with in my head was not what they gave me. That's not the problem. The problem is when you set up all of these obviously satisfying and captivating ways to wrap things up and you decide to wash away all of that to surprise everybody and you have something that's not as satisfying as your alternative. I love to be surprised. By all means, I want these writers to be so much smarter than me and have so many better ideas than me that I don't see things coming. 
that they give me something that I never knew that I wanted. And I go, holy shit, never saw that coming. That is awesome. I love that experience. But the negative side of taking that dice roll is when you say, do what they did in this finale and you have people that watch this finale and get to the end and go, why the fuck would you do that? Yeah, I didn't quite see that coming only because of what you set up in this episode. <laughs> but what you gave me is not as good as all these other alternatives. It's not. Especially when uh, I say we didn't see that coming just because it seemed like they were going in better directions, but the actual on paper idea of Harrison killing Dexter, people have predicted that since the first fucking trailer. That is the most uncreative, obvious way to go out. And there was still ways to go that direction and be more captivated and more successful, but when you make us dislike the character for most of the season, and then you shove this fucking little switcheroo of personalities with him in order to get him to that point, you're not going to get anybody, or very few people, on board with that. It's just not going to work. And so, unfortunately, the finale itself totally stained my reception of the season when it could have gone either way. I could have walked away with an awesome finale and said, you know what, it was a little rocky along the way, but overall, because we got to the end destination that we did, this was a great season of Dexter, and I can't wait to watch it all again, knowing where things end, and see how certain things I was rocky on throughout the season have improved potentially because of where we got by the end of it. Did the ends justify the means? But unfortunately, it's a conversation of because they fucked it up so badly and because even now, two days later, I'm still livid and I'm still almost in denial of how bad this was and, and, and just in a total shock that I'm once again in this position going, how do you fuck this up? That now all of the things that I liked about the season, I like a little bit less. All the things that I disliked about the season, I dislike a little bit more. And by the end of it, it was just a gigantic mess of a revival. It was just a gigantic mess all the way around. So much potential, so many things they had going for it, so many things that they set up and they just decided not to do that was just like writing 101 that I'll, I'll never understand. And I just don't understand the argument at all that the showrunner and the writer and even Michael C. Hall, which admittedly they're saying all this in interviews before they're seeing the fan reception, that they're all so set in their ways about that this was the only way. This was the inevitable conclusion. It had to be this. To the point where, I can't remember if it was Clyde Phillips or Scott Reynolds that said this, but there's actually a quote out there to where they say that hardcore Dexter fans are going to have a hard time accepting this but smart hardcore Dexter fans will know that this was inevitable. Which is such an insulting quote for me. Maybe they didn't mean it that way, but when I read that, I think, if you don't go along with the way that I decided to end the character, you're dumb. Well, I guess I'm fucking dumb. <laughs> I guess I'm dumb as fuck, because I do not like and do not go on board with anything that you did in this finale for the, fat, the last 10 to 15 minutes. I, I don't know what else to say. It, it's just, it, it was a gigantic disappointment for me. This, I was so excited. I was so excited. When I started this Dexter review series with Mother Mayhem, just because we both have a lot of love for this, season, uh, this, this character and this series, and I had a lot of thoughts that I wanted to get out because of how much I love certain things and how much I was frustrated with certain things in those eight seasons, and when we just reviewed the first season, and then almost like an act of God, right after we dropped that first season review, Showtime comes out and announces that Dexter's coming back. Dexter's returning. In about a year, we're going to fix what we did. In about a year, you're going to have Dexter back, and we're going to right the ship. We're going to give the character and the fans the ending that you deserve. The level of excitement, I cannot measure. I was like, holy shit. I don't know if I ever believed this was going to happen, but it's fucking happening. And there was not a fiber in my being that even doubted for a second that they were not going to knock this out of the park. I looked at the fact that Michael C. Hall was coming back 
that Clyde Phillips was coming back, who was the showrunner of the first four seasons. And I think Scott Reynolds might have been the writer on those first four seasons too. Don't quote me on that. But I, I know for a fact Clyde Phillips ran the show during its best run. When you put all of that together, when you know the fact that they have had years to think about this, to write this, to debate this, to rewrite this, to reform it, they had years to form this revival after years of hearing everybody's outcry about the mistakes they made at the end of that show the first time. There was not a fiber in my being that even doubted for a second that they could fuck this up. And that's part of the reason why I was so excited. And that's part of the reason why I loved the premiere so much. And I was like, oh my God, they're going to do it. They're going to they're gonna do it. They're going to right the wrong. They're going to wash away the stain on Dexter. It's going to end incredible. And I'm going to be able to tell people that Dexter is one of the greatest shows of all time and not have to put that asterisk in. But it kind of ends shitty. And then they do it. I'm still in shock. I'm still in denial. How we got here again. It's a very, at least it seems by the, the success rate, it's a very hard thing to land the ship with a show that people love because you're never going to please everybody. Especially with a complicated character like this to where a dark path is the inevitable path, either incarceration or death. You're never going to please everybody. There's a certain amount of fans that are never going to be satisfied with a definitive end of the character. They're always going to want hope that he can come back at some point. There's a certain amount of fans that are never going to be pleased with what you give them no matter what, just because they're those type of people. Absolutely a fact. But there's a lot of people like myself that were totally on board with the inevitable dark path of death or incarceration, but we just wanted whatever path you chose to be earned and to make plausible sense and to not betray what the character is and who the character has been for eight fucking seasons in order to get there. You can't change fundamentally how the character thinks, how the character works, how the character has been the entire time that we have loved him and experienced him on screen in order to make your ending work. Because then by definition, your fucking ending doesn't work. And it blows me away that twice now they have failed to understand that to the point where I still am undecided of whether or not I prefer the ending of season eight or I prefer the ending of Dexter New Blood. I still don't know. I still don't know what I like more. Do I like this shitty forced ending where Deb gets killed off screen with this brain aneurysm or blood aneurysm and everybody in Miami Metro is left completely unresolved and he drives into this shitty ass CG hurricane and then shows himself as a, a lumberjack in exile and gave his son to a, a killer. <laughs> do I prefer that ending or do I prefer the ending of him getting shot like a fucking dog in the middle of the woods by a character that I don't like that, that uh, is then immediately forgiven and... <laughs> pushed away to uh, hopefully a, a fulfilling life by another character that I don't like in Angela, which ending do I prefer? I still don't know. And that blows me away. That blows me the fuck away that you have an ending that I have despised, not because of what happens, but because of how we got there and how it happened, the execution. I've had an ending in season eight that I have despised for years and a final season that I have despised for years and I have gotten a revival and I am undecided with whether or not I like it more than that or not. That fucking blows my mind. I said I wasn't gonna rant on the ending for another 30 minutes and I probably have. So uh, overall guys, Dexter New Blood as a season is a better final season than season eight. But as an ending to the show and as an ending to the character, I'm still undecided of whether or not it's better than season eight. I, I might eventually land on saying that I prefer the ending of the lumberjack. And that's, that's heartbreaking to even say out loud. As a season, amazing performances, very good production value, some interesting characters, but very messy writing all the way throughout. Very messy characterizations all the way throughout. 
absolute fail on the character of Harrison and making us like or be invested in this character. Really missing the energy and the pacing of the original show. Really missing the mark on delivering the feeling of a Dexter show. And giving us another horrible ending. So that, that's my overall thoughts on the season. Uh, we're we're going to have, in two days, on Thursday, we're going to have a live spoiler talk with uh, me, my buddy CP, who has watched the entire season, and most likely Sean Chandler as well. I haven't gotten a definitive yes from him, but he said most likely he'll be able to be there. Um, I, I wish that one of us really enjoyed the finale so that we could have a bit of a back and forth, but I think all three of us are on the same exact page with this finale. And CP was really positive throughout the season, much more than me and Sean was, so even he got to the end and went, nope. So you're going to get uh, the spoiler chat with all three of us, hopefully, on Thursday, if not just me and CP. And then next week on uh, Sunday, a week after the finale aired, you're going to get my ranking of all nine Dexter seasons. And then the following Tuesday, two days after that, you're going to get my ranking of all of the Dexter villains. And initially I was just going to do the big bads, but I am going to include some of the other smaller adversaries. Uh, or people that were kind of just good people that got in his way, like Angela, like LaGuerta. So that's going to be a pretty sizable ranking. That's going to be a lot of fun. So if you're a Dexter fan, first of all, thank you. If you were one of the people that have watched my finale review, that's been a very successful video. Hopefully this one is, is as successful or close to it. Um, I'm sorry <laughs> that it seems like a lot of you guys watching are pretty on par with how I feel. I wish that a lot of you guys enjoyed it more than I did, but it seems like... Uh, it's just a universal disappointment for the most part with, with what they decided to do. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this more in-depth spoiler take on the season. Please let me know your thoughts down below. And if you do like the season, let me know reasons why and be respectful about it. Man, I can't stand some of you guys that come in here and just get angry and defensive and try to assign motivations for why I have a different opinion than you. I like the fact that there's different opinions and I embrace that. So if you love this season, if you love the finale or if you fundamentally disagree with anything that I had an issue with in this review, please let me know down below so that we can discuss it and understand each other a little further because I want to understand why some of you guys like this finale. I really do. So thank you guys for watching as always. Like and share this video. Hit the subscribe button if you are a Dexter fan. Like I said, we got quite a few videos coming up over the next week and a half. And as always, guys, remember, opinions are like assholes, but that doesn't mean that you have to be.